Well, we are live now. I would like to bring Mr. Mustak Khan up to the stage for the introduction. Oh, please give me a quick moment. All right, I'm sending the request to Mr. Mustak. You'll be on stage shortly. Yes. And I would request uh, all of the speakers to put yourself on mute and uh, you can unmute yourself once your turn starts. Thank you. So good evening. We are at the end of the uh, day seminar and uh, it is my privilege to introduce a person who is going to moderate this session. But he is already uh, involved the whole day as an anchor to this program. I am talking about uh, Dr. Deepankar Shah. So, Deepang, right now, the Deepankar Shah, Dr. Deepankar Shah is uh, with PNP as advisor for national policy on water. For, uh, he is the former. He was the former uh, member of CGWB and also member secretary of CWA. He had his PhD from I am Dhanbad. He was the national coordinator in national aquifer mapping and management program also. He authored more than 100 publications and uh, uh, he, pub uh, he edited two books which was published by uh, Springer. He was the recipient of National Geo Scheme Award in 2011 and also the Groundwater Excellence Award in 2014 given by Government of India. He was the visiting professor to IIT Khadakpur and right now he is the um, expert advisor on water to the government of Gujarat. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Here is uh, Dr. Shah for the concluding session as the moderator. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mustak Sahab. You see, we have a very distinguished panelist in the concluding session. Yes. Uh, the panelist, uh, I, will, I will give a brief introduction with uh, uh, the first is uh, uh, Sushil Gupta. <coughs> who is presently the member of Punjab Water Resources Regulatory Authority. You know the Water Resources Regulatory Authority are coming up uh, one after another states. In some of the states, they are they remain as a part of some, some of the departments and in some of the states, they are becoming independent body. So it is very, very important that how they are taking shape, the Water Resource Regulatory Authority. So he is a member of Punjab. State Water Resource Regulatory Authority. He was chairman of Central Groundwater Authority and he was consultant to National Water Mission, World Bank, then advisor to CII and he was chairman to Central Groundwater Board also. So many publications, many report, uh, uh, supervised many investigations. So I am not going into detail. Uh, so he, he is our uh, one of the most distinguished panelists. Then uh, Miss Barnita Doronbos is from he. She is head water and infrastructure uh, Helveta Swiss Incorporation. Uh, she is the uh, leading in the water and infrastructure area of Helveta. Uh, she is an agricultural engineer specialized in irrigation. She has been working in rural development since, ni since 1996 in Latin America. Her experience includes smallholder irrigation, irrigated water resources management, climate change, etc. Prior to working at Helvetas, Barnita did research on use of sprinkler irrigation by small farmers in Wengingen University and worked with SNB as irrigation advisor. Then we have another uh, very distinguished panelist, uh, Madam Dr. Marcilla D. Suja. Uh, she is executive director of WOTR Center for Resilience Studies. WOTR, you all know, very distinguished NGO working in uh, water sector in various parts of India. She is a physician by learning and opted for community health early in her career. She is an alumnus of Government Medical College in Nagpur uh, and a Tech Me Fellow of the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, she has spent more than three decades in rural development in South America as program coordinator for women's promotion in the Indo-German watershed development program, Maharashtra. And she has founded the Sampada Trust and initiated several innovative intervention in WOTRs. Uh, Very distinguished madam, uh, welcome you. And then the uh, other panelist is Shilpa Nishchal. She is senior counselor 
in CII, Confederation of Indian Industries, specifically uh, in Triveni Water Institute in CII. Uh, she has over two decades of experience on diverse sustainable development issues, particularly related to water resource. Her areas of work include water resources evaluation, hydrometeorological analysis, and hydrological risk assessment. He spearheads many projects in CII Water Institute, Triveni Water Institute, and supervises many activities. So, with all these uh, distinguished panel, uh, let me start. I have given the responsibility to moderate the uh, the session. So, I think already I have discussed some discussion point with our eminent uh, panelists. But I was thinking that I should mention some of the uh, few few points that has been that has emerged. There are many things that has been discussed throughout the uh, the day, but uh, uh, some very important issues that has come up. I will just mention. You will speak on on the on the on the program that we have already decided. But if you can give some thought on these points, that is also welcome. So number one is the, there was a discussion uh, in the beginning. I am not mentioning the presenter's name. I am only. Uh, highlighting the points, those have been discussed. Number one, interbasin water, water transfer and interlinking of rivers in India. It's a very important interbasin water transfer and interlinking of river because there are diversity in availability of water in space and time domain in different parts of India. That's why it is very, very important. And then how to store a skewed rainfall, uh, you know, because of the climate change, the rainfall pattern is changing in space and time domain the rainfall is becoming skewed and of course there is a, uh, a, a discussion huge discussion and activity on artificial recharge rainwater harvesting but still is that enough to uh, take on the skewed uh, pattern of the rainfall that is that is coming up then uh, another point that has come up clean water how much it is get importance vis-a-vis -vis volumetric scarcity. I mean, when in India, when you discuss about the water stress, we generally gravitate towards the volumetric uh, availability, volumetric shortage. But recent studies that are coming up that that is highlighting the quality issues also. So where is the trade-off? And does the quality is getting enough importance in the in the government documents, in the policy documents, and their execution. Then people led another point that has come up that people led sustainable management system, shared ownership of water, very, very important. People led sustainable management system. Then uh, in one of the discussion, it has come up that what about the water regulatory authority that is coming up in the different states? I think the Mr. Sushil Gupta is a member of Punjab uh, regulatory. Uh, or water regulatory authority, she can, she can throw some light, how it is coming, how transparent it is, how it is eff effective in resolving the disputes. And then the during the last part of the discussion, it has come up about the data availability and data use, data generation, how the community and NGOs can be involved. You know, the government departments are generating data, collecting data, now the NGOs are also collecting data, generating data. So communities are also, they have also started collecting data, generating data, how to store them in a common platform, in a common format. That is a, uh, hugely uh, challenging and groundwater data is needed for any decision making. We need a time dependent data. So if somebody starts collecting data and stop collecting data after two years, then what about its use after four years or five years? Because when you take a decision on water or groundwater, we need historic data. We need some, say, modeling also to see what can happen in the future also. So data is to a great extent also time dependent. Uh, so with these few points that I have highlighted, I first hand over to uh, Mr. Sushil Gupta, our distinguished specialist, first to speak on uh, on the on the issues and whatever he want to speak after the day long discussion. Uh, uh, Sushil Gupta, sir, please. So, to, uh, 
kindly give me the sharing this thing i want to share a presentation yes share sharing sir you have the access to share sir you can click on the uh, up arrow at the bottom you can open your ppt and then you can click on the up arrow <clears throat> Is it visible? No, it's not. I think. Uh, Is it visible? Not yet, sir. Not yet, sir. Not yet. Oh. Not yet. Okay. So probably you can stop the share and you can try once again. You can keep your PPT open and then click on the up arrow, and then you need to click share screen. So what is it you are getting on the screen, sir? No, just a moment. I have to cancel it, and then I am getting this. This only, whatever, all the panelists and everything. Should I keep my PPT in the PPT mode and then share? Sorry, sir. You have a PPT open? Yeah. Yes. Once you have kept it open, you can come to Air Meet and uh, click on the Share Screen of option, which is the up arrow. Once you click that, you will find a window. I'm finding a window, but it is asking me to share either the entire screen or the. Yes, you can click entire screen. Probably that should work. In case you have any issues, you can click Share Entire Screen so that it goes to your desktop, and you can open. You can click on your PPT. It is not doing anything. Once you click the entire screen, what does it happen? Just a moment. Just a moment. You need to click on that, and then now it will have either submit or next option somewhere. No, because it is entire screen application window. Is yes, once you click entire screen, what is it happening? Once you click that at the bottom right, you need to click the submit or what are the options you are getting today? I am getting only cancel, nothing else. Right. So, if you click <laughs> application, what's happening? Application window also cancel only, nothing else. All right. Or if there any way you can send the uh, PPT to the organizer in WhatsApp or something, maybe we'll try to share from our end. I can send you a mail. Uh, so, Dipanga sir, would it be uh, possible for you to get it from him so that we can share it? Yeah, yeah. You mail me. You mail me. I will mail to Jayesh, and okay. Jayesh can arrange it. So okay. probably in the, in the meantime we can proceed with other speaker if you are okay with it. Yeah. <clears throat> so you are mailing me? Uh huh. Okay. So uh, in the meantime we can uh, uh, we can uh, we request uh, uh, Miss Barnita Domain uh, uh, Dor uh, Doran Bose, Mrs. Barnita. Barnett. We like to hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very much, very well, Doctor. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm trying to um, share a screen. Is that correct? Can you see that? Yeah, we can see it. Great, yes, excellent. Well, first of all, Doctor Sa um, and 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 all the audience, I would really like to start off with uh, congratulating um, Partners in Prosperity and all the uh, institutions and the, the great speakers that we have heard today with this very interesting seminar in which you have managed to show many different voices on the key challenges of water, uh, water management in India, knowledge, information, policies, but, but also many actions that are already underway to improve water use in agriculture and also industry. And I'm really quite impressed and also a little bit relieved because, of course, this uh, title of the seminar, Looming Water Crisis, is, uh, is indeed shown to be a concern, but it's not in an era of despair, I think. Uh, and I think the, the various presentations have, have already contributed to making it quite clear um, what could be done. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Bernita. I'm working in Helvetas. Just a, sh a few words on, on, on Helvetas. It's a Swiss-based NGO, and we aim to support our partners 
in uh, close to 30 countries in the world, in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and Eastern Europe, to improve the living conditions of um, the people that are most economically, socially, and also politically disadvantaged in the communities. Um, we work together with public partners, civil society, of course, and also with, with private partners. And um, Intercorporation, perhaps you know that, has been working in India for for close to three decades, and currently we work uh, with uh, Partners in Prosperity as our, our trusted and strategic partner in various projects in, in India. Uh, no, WAPRA one already mentioned, uh, also the ones on, on uh, organic promoting organic agriculture in, in climate. So, Dr. Saha, the question was, what have we learned from uh, the experience on water productivity and water use efficiency in agriculture that might be relevant for the future? Well, first of all, and that's why I'm sharing these these images on on the project. Uh, I will tell you something about the WAPRO project. So this um, effort between multiple stakeholders to to join forces to increase uh, water productivity, the amount um, that is produced per per drop of water. Now, this initiative started in 2015 and is now running into its in, into its second phase. Uh, it is a response, of course, to uh, the quite, quite high share of water resources worldwide that's being used in irrigated agriculture in crops such as paddy and cotton and countries, um, and I'm passing on to the next slide. Um, passing on to the next slide showing um, the countries that are currently uh, in, involved in this effort. So it's Pakistan, India, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Myanmar, Madagascar, and most recently also countries in, in West Africa. And um, um, the main approach was already mentioned, but just to, 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 to mention that perhaps again is push-pull policy, moving value change towards more socially and also environmentally sustainable livelihoods at the base and, and the value change as such. And, and many partners are involved. I won't mention each and every of them, but you see uh, you see them here. And what does it mean, push-pull policy? So how does it manage to engage with multinational and also Swiss companies that are concerned um, on sustainably sourced uh, food uh, commodities, um, um, which we call the pool factor, and is also, of course, supporting actors on the ground, service providers, extension services to um, increase the knowledge and the practices of farmers to use appropriate uh, technologies, reducing water use, uh, but also, of course, to, to increase their, their income. And on the policy side, um, the, the project is generating important uh, experiences which contribute to, to, to policy changes at local level, at the catchment level, that involve local management, water management and the users themselves. Now, what is... Um, what is what the, the, the project has, has, has evidenced so far in terms of results? First of all, on, on the spread and the adoption and the effects of um, water-saving irrigation technology and also related agronomical practices. Of course, it's, it's clear that these efforts make more sen most sense in water-scarce con context. And examples perhaps of the practices that have been promoted is, of course, um, service irrigation, shortening furrows, intercropping, alternate wetting and drying, but also drip and sprinkler irrigation, um, land level, land leveling um, for, for paddy rice, but also working on more drought resistant cotton uh, varieties in rain fed contexts and, and mulching, for example. And very much, uh, very important as well, uh, involving farmers in monitoring uh, of, of groundwater use, but also in soil water. Now, so far, um, data shows that in different countries, adoption rates of these um, these practices, these technologies vary highly. Um, on average, 20 to 30 percent, per 30 percent, uh, with with some outliers as well, up to up to 60 uh, percent. But this is this is a point to be made. Uh, of course, on the effects on water use, on irrigation efficiency at field level, there are good examples that show it, show a reduction in, in water use, for example, with the practice of shortening pharaohs in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan and cotton. Uh, this resulted in, 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 in water savings up to 20 to 40 percent. 
Uh, and in India, uh, it was it was clear that the, there's an increase in, in the water productivity and rice comparing to the, to the flooded practice before with alternate wetting, drying and, and combined practices. Um, also in the presentation of uh, Dr. Dehindra that um, uh, Tiwari, Dehindra Tiwari that, that antecedated uh, me. Um, but very important beyond, uh, let's say, the, the, the reduction of water use is also the effects on farmer incomes. Um, uh, moving to organic uh, produce, uh, reducing um, the use of agrochemicals and also um, the labor required for um, rice production, for example, of course, lowers production costs and that means um, higher um, net income for the farmers, which has been been uh, been shown in in various countries. So this is this is good news in terms of of effects. Uh, there's also, and that must also be mentioned, uh, of course, a need to understand what's happening at the wider production system with these changes in in practices and in technologies. In Pakistan, there's a, a good good example of a study done into what happens when farmers change at a lot quite a large scale in in an area. From directly sown rice um, to directly sown rice from um, before transplanting rice. This is a, a task that very much uh, involves uh, involved women in, in transplanting the rice. And while um, the change towards uh, direct sown rice is, of course, beneficial in terms of less strenuous work, uh, some water saving um, and higher production. Uh, the team there of the project also recognized that, uh, that this is a negative gender uh, impact and, um, and have worked uh, on, on identifying alternative opportunities for women to, uh, to go to schooling and to find alternative uh, jobs um, to... Um, as they, they, their task has been, let's say, uh, moved out. So that's very important to keep in, in, in mind. Then on the incentive side, what makes people um, move, what, what make farmers do things? Um, it, it's very important that, um, that, of course, at an individual farmer level, if you don't, uh, if you cannot use the water you saved, uh, then water savings as such, is, it's not so much of an incentive, uh, especially if, if water doesn't have a, um, a, a, a cost, um, a, a direct economical cost. Um, but what is very important as an incentive for farmers is the increase in the productivity of their crop and the profitability. That's what really uh, motivates um, uh, adoption. Um, um, so that's very important to mention. Um, of course, private sector uh, actors along value change should also create additional incentive mechanisms for farmers to um, um, to um, to to apply these uh, these technologies and the practices. Um, of course, uh, currently the project is receiving uh, co-financing, important co-financing from private sector companies, but through offering premium prices to um, to in ensure a more stable market, but also uh, promoting and, and financing access to, to microcredits and, uh, and extension. Um, now, uh, around um, the, the topic of um, now what's next? What, what can we do with, with, with these lessons? Perhaps there are three ways forward. First of all, it's clear that uh, reducing um, water use in value change with a focus on farmer benefits is a way forward. We have found that the topic, the notion of water stewardship, so collective action towards more sustainable use of water with a value change approach is a useful approach. We need to link um, consumers with, with sensible, sensible traders that are willing to invest in the social and economic sustainability of their, um, of their value change with farmers uh, with the focus on improved livelihoods. And this approach enables a mutual understanding of, of the roles and also synergies be between all these players. So what we need is, of course, a motivated private sector uh, act actor that's willing to invest and support farmers in, in, in changing practices. And of course, here the argument, there's an economic argument for improving water efficiency, but also, and we've heard it today, it's the risk for businesses uh, if, if water st scarcity is increasing. Then on the farmer side, it's also very important that farmers see a business case in the sense that it, that the improved practices um, increase their, increase their income, increase their re returns. Um, and then 
another very important part of the of the formula is of course also consumer awareness and as an international working ngo based in switzerland this is an important factor and we've heard it also this morning from uh, uh, from corinne de menge the sdc um we need to contribute both in in, in a country as india as, as as in a country as switzerland to towards more consumer awareness on what are the water footprints of our products, the products that we use, um, especially if they come from, from water scarce uh, uh, contexts. Now, there are, of course, uh, standards uh, developed for, for organic, for, um, for greener and um, production, but also for, um, for um, better water stewardship. These, these, the AWS standard, it's a standard that the, this program also works with, helps to guide and also recognize sustainable water use practices. Uh, however, currently the producers working with WAPRO are not certified uh, under the, but this is a future pathway to follow. And what we need to promote is that these standards that will allow um, also in the future consumers to take uh, informed decisions are applicable in the context of smallholders. And which is a reason why Helvetus is contributing to the technical committee on the uh, Alliance for Water Stewardship. That's one point. The second point, what we need to do more. A value chain approach is, is good, it's not sufficient. We need to um, maintain a clear focus also ground on the catchment on territorial level um, there if private sector is a, is a water user as we heard from the industry it's of course important that, that the private sector takes on a role in water governance structures but also if they're farther um, uh, downstream the, va um, the value chain let's say that they participate and support water stewardship plans and actions on the ground and in general, it's very important for water governance um, to be inclusive, to be community-based. Um, what we saw, we, we heard it before, the importance of making sure that people actually know how much water uh, uh, is available and is being used by the different water users to also um, be able to hold water managers uh, accountable for distribution and especially the topic of equity and access. And last but not least, um, we need to be very much aware, I think, for the wider effects that shifts in irrigation methods and production practices can have, uh, not only from a resource efficiency perspective, water efficiency, but also from an equity perspective, um, how this socially um, impacts the systems, what happens with incomes, and what happens also with a voice of, of water users in, in structures. And we, of course, have to, and that's perhaps more a message to, 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 um, yeah, to, to, to the project, to ourselves, that we need to, to further understand and also try to lift the barriers for those who have not been able so far to adopt these, these practices. And, um, and finally, a call also to, um, to perhaps the young researchers that are are are, are in this uh, this 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 webinar, um, they're understanding these wider effects of of uh, water use and, and production changes is uh, is an important task to do, uh, when always making sure that we listen also what makes farmers do what they do. And I thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Ms. Barnita, for. Uh, immensely enriching and informative uh, uh, views. Uh, so we got a flavor of what Helvetus is doing around the world in different countries also. And you have rightly mentioned about the, not only the resource perspective, the equity perspective is also very important, very, very important. So uh, with this, uh, uh, I will uh, uh, request uh, if the uh, the presentation is uh, ready to make for uh, Sushil Gupta. Yes, sir, the presentation is ready with me. I can share the PPT. Yes, please share. And uh, I request uh, Gupta Sab to, uh, you just tell uh, next, he will change the PPT. Place yes, the PPT. I do that. Emis, please place the PPT. Can you hear me so that I can start talking at least? Yes, yes, yes. We can hear you. Okay. So good evening to all of you. It's probably the fag end of the day long session. We've heard a lot of experts speak about and my talk will be mostly like a layman who knows something about water and keeps on uh, discussing with the, everybody regarding water, whether it's a farmer, whether it's a hydrogeologist, whether it's a planner, whether it's a regulator or whatever. So my 
and then i was given a work by uh, dr saha that i should talk about uh, why there is an over exploitation what are the policy interventions by the government and uh, what to do finally what should be done so all my thing is basically very non technical easy to understand and for a common man so yeah uh, thank you so don't know go, don't go by my affiliations written here next please uh, i am just talking as a layman again as i am saying so if you see uh, in the morning the secretary water resources was also saying that why should the demand increase it has to increase there is no there is no question about it the only thing is that how you manage it whether you make that into physically yes demand is increasing but your requirement is not increasing there are two different things you don't use because you become more water efficient that is a basic thing so if you see the per capita water availability is reducing there is no doubt about it next please so water requirement we should always consider what is our water footprint you see no doubt that as the development goes on higher and higher you will have a higher water footprint so it's not that that india's water resources are sufficient as we grow our population increases our food requirement increases food habits change and the standard of living you know if i required say 50 years ago if it's, i required 100 liters of water today i require 400 liters because my standards have increased for everything so overall the water requirement will increase climate change is another deterrent that is coming in the way of uh, good quality water or more less water available for recharge or use and the main thing is again in the agriculture sector people have been talking since morning about the rice rice in india we consume almost 3000 liters to produce 1 kg of rice whereas the developed world like us uses only about 1200 1300 liters so that means we are highly inefficient people as far as agriculture production also goes next please now what have been the various policy interventions first of all we have a national water policy which has mainly it wants to have a national water framework law it has prioritized what is the use of uh, which uh, uh, use will be most important and it also takes into account the health of the river we should adapt to the climate these are all normal things which are talking every day but it has no application so far because it's just a policy at the national level with no clear cut directives very frankly and i think as i heard uh, the secretary again this morning and probably dr saha is also involved we are coming out with a new policy i do hope that it, it is more uh, inclusive and more uh, in the directional side then we have a very important uh, plan that is a national action plan for climate change under which there are several missions and the mission that we are concerned about is on the national water mission i have worked in this mission also for about a year and one of the most important uh, objectives of this mission was i would say is improving the water use efficiency by 20% in the coming decade but i am again i am sorry to say probably not much has happened since then then we have a national water framework bill in line in as i said in the national water policy it was uh, decided to have a national water framework bill that bill has also been prepared but it has probably not found the favor of the government so far because it has not been approved at any level next please then we have a, we came out with a model groundwater bill in 2017 which recognized the principle of subsidiarity in the sense that Uh, it will be a groundwater will be treated as a common pool resource as a common heritage and the state will be the public trustee of groundwater of course this is very difficult in practice and legally those supreme court judgments are there to support it but as a legislation it has not come so far it is a very good thought process i was one of the authors for this also so it is ultimately this is of the hour to manage our resources now we have also been talking about community participation that the petri approach to groundwater is one of the best approaches we have several examples aravri river by rajinder singh then ralegaon siddhi by anna hazare then we have one ngo led program andhra pradesh farmers managed groundwater system this is a huge program hivri bazar popatra pawar then we have now the latest is the government run and world with the world bank we have the atal bhujal yojana 
in this also we are talking of water security plans and stakeholder involvement my one uh, question about all this is all these programs were very successful are rather very successful in their areas then the because these are all leadership driven programs like rajinder singh anna hazare popar rao pawar so they are continuing in these areas but have they been replicated i have my doubts andhra pradesh now to manage system this was not a leader driven it was a ngo driven program under the uh, world bank and asian development bank schemes but again once they withdrew the, this program has also virtually tapered off i hope do hope that atal bhujal yojana succeeds in this and after the world bank and government of india withdraw from the area from the six states that are undertaking this yojana the stakeholder participation and stakeholder uh plans that they have made they continue to implement those next please now this is my last slide by the way so it's going to be very short my first thing as a layman is whenever i talk about management of water we have been talking since the morning about how to manage water maybe there were one or two like mr marwa talked about uh, uh, ground water mapping through nacum etc but by and large we have been talking about management but have we measured the resource do we know how much resource do we have we need to measure the resource accurately number 1 and then only i can manage that resource now for managing the resource the problem in india is that we are all talking at different levels there is surface water i say it's at the basin level ground water i say it's at the block level the municipality says it's at the city level the water shed people say that is at the water shed level nobody knows how much water can i consume in this area for example i am developing a smart city the water for a smart city is being planned at the level of the city only we do not know the hydrological boundaries in which the city is situated so what are the total water resources of that watershed and how much water i can allocate to that city or how much water i allocate to that and what will be the remaining water for other uh, uses so my approach in this would be that we should be having a common unit of measurement common area of measurement and if we keep it at the watershed level then all the schemes in the country whatever schemes related to water they should be first dealt at the watershed level there there is so much of duplicacy also whether it's artificial jar scheme whether it's water use efficiency scheme whether it's a water supply scheme whether it's a surface water irrigation whatever so it should be planned at the watershed level so that the you know this is the intervention that is required in this watershed then the best thing is that i would like to share one slide can you click on the next piece yeah you see this is the uh, table which is been prepared by central water commission in the year 2014 and it talks about the guidelines for improving water use efficiency uh, as i told you the national water mission that one of the targets was to increase efficiency by 20% so in these sectors if i increase if we increase the efficiency by various uses just by 20% we are saving 129 billion cubic meters of water every year and if i achieve full efficiency then we are achieving saving another 16 uh, almost 166 billion cubic meters of water can we do this can we achieve this target by whatever methods we want have we do we have any road map for this how to achieve this 129 figure 129 bcm figure no i don't think we have any targets in place please can you go back to the slide no no uh, you go back to the earlier slide yeah so one is that we should have highly efficient use of water across all sectors whether it is drinking water whether it is irrigation whether it is industry whatever it and the government has been trying to set up a national bureau of water use efficiency since almost i would say now 12 years i do hope that we come up with something so that we have star rating for example the shoes that i am wearing is they made of leather which has a three star rating meaning that it has used the benchmark water and it's not polluted so i should go for a three star just like in electrical appliances why not why not uh, label our rice also Uh, the rice that we export the other country should have a labeling system that if india exports this star rating rice then only we'll buy it we'll automatically start saving water in production so there should be something to do about efficiency 
of course all these things which i have pointed out here have been discussed by various speakers since the morning with the seminar was on water crisis conjunctive use community pool irrigation allocate irrigation water as per me that we are talking about the pani bachao pani that electricity scheme of punjab that is on gujarat also has such a scheme then data we have talked a lot about data but my data what i am trying to say here is i am talking of data from a literally illiterate farmer's point of view he does not understand artificial intelligence he does not understand anything he just wants to know how much water do i have what can i do and this has been done in participatory programs so far but somehow later on it all tapered off and that has been restricted to only those areas so we need a very huge outreach program along with data which can be used by an illiterate person to for his benefit to irrigate his crops etc again we have talked a lot we, in the previous presentation also we talked about the true cost of water unless until anybody for that matter a farmer a commoner does not realize the what water costs and what it will cost him he is not going to pay it that's very clear the governance has to be uh, collective after considering all these four dimensions then uh, although uh, saas saab had not told me earlier to talk about water regulatory authority but yes since he has now uh, said i'll just speak for a couple of minutes about that Uh, the punjab water uh, regulation uh, and development authority was formed just about 4 months back and uh, i am one of the founder members of the authority it has two members and one chairperson apart from the supporting staff so it's very new to say what experience do we have or what uh, we have done uh, the only thing that i can say is that we have come out with the uh, draft guidelines to grant uh, permissions for ground for withdrawal for industries etc they are in public domain and we are inviting objections from all the, all over whoever is interested please do file your objections or comments or whatever you can call it the on, and the only thing that i am uh, though i am part of the authority is that even punjab authority or for that matter central ground water authority which is the apex authority in the country we are by and large trying to govern or regulate only the industrial water use we are not trying to do anything as a regulator to the agriculture water and i am surprised that even the national green tribunal has in its uh, latest judgment uh, mentioned that agriculture water has uh, has a different dimension as compared to the industrial water so indirectly saying that agriculture water has to be dealt in a very delicate manner or whatever it is but whatever we should do it and even cwa or for that matter most of the authorities punjab authority by and large are not touching agriculture water in one way or the other so and the last thing is uh, of course uh, political will is required water is such a sector that without the political will we just cannot do anything i think that's all next Yeah, thank you. Can you oh. stop sharing? Yeah. Yes, yes. So you are over, sir? Yeah, yeah, I am over. Okay. Thank you, sir. And uh, as we we know you, you are always frank and uh, calling spade a spade. Uh, there are, obviously there are many policies, many many announcements, many documentation, but on ground, uh, uh, what is happening? That is another thing, and. Uh, <clears throat> obviously the community driven uh, uh, uh community driven groundwater management i think our marcela disuja the next uh, uh, panelist uh, she will throw more light on this i also feel personally it is personality driven i am not sure how it can be a people's movement coming out of anna hazare or popotlal power or rajender singh or some award winning individual stockholm water prize or Uh, say uh, max is a award winning uh, some uh, uh, personality when it will come and reach to in the, into the ground level and the community they uh, at large they will participate in managing the both surface water resource and ground water resource in the village level so madam dr disuja you are a doctor for human also and doctor for water also please Thank you so much uh, Dr Sahab 
and uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, presentation. I have to say that right from the morning, I have been overwhelmed by the very intense and informative uh, presentations and discussions uh, that we have had. Not enough of discussions, but we were so, uh, I mean, the information is so rich. Uh, you know, coming at the end of the day and uh, coming from the practice on the ground, uh, and my organization has been working in watershed development right from uh, 1992 or 1993, uh, mainly because we saw water scarcity as a cause for, and degraded lands as a cause for poverty in uh, Ahmednagar district. Okay. And now, in a few, a few years ago, uh, ISRO had released its uh, report which shows that land degradation in the country has increased by 1.9 million hectares between 2005 and 2013. And this is after so much of watershed development having been done in the country. The question I asked myself when I saw this was, what does this mean for the farmer? What does this mean for our groundwater? And this is what we realized after we had done watershed development, so-called successfully. As we all know, watershed development is for soil conservation and water conservation. And with this increasing in the village, agriculture production and productivity increased, water levels increased in the village, uh, in the villages, and we've got a lot of, con there's a lot of data around about that. However, with the increase in groundwater, we realized that there was a spudding of wells and bore wells right across, which meant groundwater extraction. And in a way, we may think that watershed development has contributed to India's exploitation of the groundwater. Uh, this is just by the way, okay? I do know that this is very important because agriculture is the survival of more than 55% of our uh, population and most of our farming communities. What we also, what we realized is it's not just increase in agriculture, it's also the intensity of agriculture that has increased. Uh, here I would say that with water availability in a number of our uh, subsurface uh, aquifers, you know, a number of farmers are able to take the crop in summer, which normally should not be done in a rain-fed, uh, rain shadow area. But this is what is happening. It has brought in possibilities for uh, cultivation. Another big problem what we realized was that with water availability, a number of farmers increased um, their uh, wells and bore well, uh, no, the numbers of wells and bore wells increased. However, gradually, those who could dig more bore wells dug more bore wells within their wells, and that led to, in a way, water stealing from others who had. Some bore wells have some wells have gone dry. Other bore wells have increased. So this has been a kind of a a negative vicious cycle, which, what we observed in a number of villages. This led water to re, WOTR, my organization, to realize that just doing watershed development is insufficient. We need it to be accompanied by water, groundwater management, water stewardship, and agriculture productivity. Unless the farmers see good production of their agriculture in a, in a climate resilient manner and following more of organic practices, they will not, nobody will contribute to water management. And with that, we realized that it was water stewardship and uh, climate resilient agriculture has become a part of our whole approach to um, to watershed development and the plus 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 production has increased farmers have uh, uh, have adopted it we realized we had to also see that the gender aspects were considered it's very easy for us to forget all about it 
However, with this need, you know, there was no pathway at the time to follow. This started way back. <coughs> Our water budgeting started. <coughs> water budgeting started way back in around 2007, 8 in a small trial and error method. A little more um, effectively around 2009, 10, 11. By about 2013, 14, we were able to come up with a more um, uh, a more uh, systematic way of doing it through a lot of trial and error methods, experiences with the communities. That was the time when we then started our water stewardship. What we got the community and not just individual isolated communities, we realized we had to bring the whole cluster of villages together because it is the villagers who need to challenge one another. We are all outsiders. No matter whether we speak the local language or not, we are still outsiders to that culture. So bringing a cluster of villages together was very important because they talk the language, they challenge one another. And that for us has been a very positive impact. We bring the villages together first to assess their own water status. It's called the village health chart, the first motivation for them to take it up. We link this up with the village uh, water and sanitation committee. We, may, we train this community to be the water uh, management committee linked under the Gram Panchayat and together with the village development committee. So it, they are all interlinked. And this, once the villagers have mm -hmm. an idea about their water, their water status, it motivates them to do something about it and then begins the uh, repairs and maintenance of watershed structures that have already been done. This has been one of the lacuna in most of the watershed projects. Structures have been done. It's the maintenance and management that is quite forgotten uh, after that. This program integrates repairs and maintenance, which is now taken up by this village committee. Following that, they prepare their water budget plans based on the, the what they traditionally do, but now we link it to the rainfall patterns and the water assessment in the wells and bore wells. So the standard water budgeting, I think, which is practiced by many. Here is where we get the villagers to um, uh, villagers to make their plans and to move more towards water uh, uh, water management, the judicious use of water. And linking it up with climate resilient agriculture, with good agriculture practices, has been very uh, important in this whole process. Getting women to be water stewards, you know, in this has been a big uh, uh, process in this. Just to share, this is a book that we have uh, published uh, a few years ago. I can show you, uh, tell you the link. This tells us what we do and how we do it. This process of water stewardship, we decided that we would uh, work it together with the Maharashtra Groundwater Development and Management Act, uh, which was uh, developed in 2009 and became more effective in 14. So we took the, uh, we studied it, we found out what were the needs they had, and we had to work to make this happen. Our concern is how do we make the government policies and programs as appropriate? How do we make them effective? And if they need modifications, how do we do it? So our whole process is to help towards realizing policy, modifying it if required. And I'm happy to say that this water stewardship has been uh, quite uh, impactful in a number of villages. And even after, uh, you know, when we, when we had the drought last year and in a previous year, we found that there were uh, newspaper cuttings, uh, newspaper articles coming out from villages where we were not directly related, uh, not directly related to now. And the papers were then ident identifying what the farmers were doing in managing groundwater when other villages in the neighborhood were suffering severe drought. One of the important uh, aspects of the Maharashtra Groundwater Act was to bring villages together particularly when they shared an aquifer. Now, this was a big challenge. 
So what we did in this process was uh, my team of young geologists, we studied the aquifer. We found one of the, one of the aquifers that had 14 villages to, uh, that shared the aquifer. And this is in the Maratwada area. We had to get the 14 villages together to understand the aquifer. First of all, to develop the aquifer, uh, you know, sorry, to understand what is below. So we developed a 3D model about it. I will share the link uh, on the uh, on this um, in the chat box. Uh, we developed the uh, a three D me method to develop the three D model where the villagers together from the different clusters, women and men, came together to develop it, and with that they began to understand how their villages shared a common aquifer, and therefore they had to come and work together and protect the water resources of all of them because this entire 14 villages are the stewards of this particular aquifer. If one suffers, one village suffers, the other does. And uh, this is a process that continues. What was very interesting in this was, we found that some of the village, uh, the uh, water committee members, the aquifer committee members, representatives from the different villages, a man and a woman came together for it. And we found that some of the women, particularly one woman, Leela Bai, she was so um, uh, she was so informed and so touched by understanding the, understanding the aquifer that she herself decided that whenever they had the aquifer uh, model taken to villages, she herself would go to motivate the people. And uh, with this, you know, she put her whole self behind it to make it happen. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, data collected from this. There are uh, the water saving has been done. Uh, you know how farmers have been using it in a judicious way. However, I have to say that it is not an easy process because finally it is the income for farmers that um, that is important. The challenge is how can we get the farmers who have a water resource. Uh, share the water with others. And here is a question I would put, you know, to us in the panel and to the, uh, particularly to all of us here. The National Water Policy 2012 considers water as a common pool resource. However, in practice, the water resource that is in the farm of a particular owner belongs to that farmer. So this is the, this is the uh, challenge we face. How do we consider it? And yet you have the water that uh, uh, of the wells and bow wells belonging to the particular farmer. I would really like to see how taking this discussion forward, you know, and addressing this water crisis, how can we really effectivize making water a common pool resource? Another question I would, uh, and here it comes to the same point. Uh, one of the points was uh, raised by a previous uh, speaker was, what happens after a project is over and the agency, the NGO leaves the village? Yes, quite often these villages go back to where they were. It doesn't sustain in the long, in the long run. Uh, Sometimes we do find a number of villages continuing uh, because they can still see the benefits. However, it does decline to some extent until something happens. But here I have to put another question to all of us. Do we expect that the villagers will continue um, the, with the same momentum after a project is stopped, particularly when we have newer situations that they face. For instance, with the climate change, with the, the challenges that are coming, with, coming up with climate change, with the risks that are coming up with there, how do we get these communities to continue learning from these processes? Sometimes there are new policies that are coming in. How do we keep them informed so that they can take informed decisions that are equitable and that work towards the 
um, work towards the common good. So this is this is another uh, question we keep asking ourselves. So uh, there is another point. What I want to share is that besides doing the water stewardship, we are shortly coming out with a manual on how to implement the water stewardship from our experience, uh, which we'd like to then share. But we have also started. Uh, 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 we are currently testing this on the ground in a large number of villages is the water governance standards for rural communities. How do we assess whether the rural communities are managing their groundwater well? They need to have a standard. They need to pass a test to say, yes, they are doing well. You know, so currently this is the um, assessment that is in progress. And we do hope in the next few months in the next six months, we should be able to come out with a result to share. And we would, we are, I think we are testing it this in about um, 70 to about 100 villages, probably in different geographies currently in Maharashtra. Into this whole process, what we realized that we could not do it alone only as a practice practitioner organization. And that was the reason why we started our research unit to, uh, to uh, look at more micro level information and put this together for the farming communities. And here I would say that if we have to go forward in um, managing groundwater well, we need to look at it in a, we need to enter it in a very collaborative uh, way where the different stakeholders work together. We have the policy makers who are most crucial for it and the practitioners at the district level. We have the NGOs at the district level. We need the science community to bring in the information that NGOs and practitioners need. We need the civil society, we need the uh, corporate society, the corporate agencies with their funding to support us in this common effort. We need to, and we need to keep the community at the center because they are the leaders to take it forward. And, and this is where we realize that collaboration, bringing science, practice, can move to policy to make a sustainable change. But there's one, one last point I want to raise before I stop my sharing. Uh, uh, today has been a very intensive day when we have looked at the water resources from the anthropogenic perspective. We looked at water, what humans need. We looked at agriculture, which brings in income. But I think we would be making a mistake if we only stick to looking at water as a product to be used to bring in economic returns. We need to change our perspective and look at it from the ecosystem's perspective. The question was asked, what happens with uh, should we look at inter, uh, interbasinal transfers? Should we look at interlinking of rivers? I'm not an expert in that. So I'm not going to get into that. But it raised a question uh, to me is, do we not need to understand nature and flow with nature rather than break the nature streams? If we look at what is happening in some of our cities in a in other parts of the country, the city of Bangalore, which has lost all its water bodies. What's happening to the water resources? In so many of our cities, we have tapped and covered the water bodies, which were natural streams, and then we expect to get water. So I think we have to rethink the way we are looking at nature and probably understand nature better and flow with nature. We probably would need to look at a river system approach, you know, to managing the water resources better. And that's why I would come from the perspective of, do we need to look at an ecosystems perspective where land, water resources, the biodiversity, agriculture, livelihoods, um, livestock, all need to be looked at as a whole, where we have the a systemic approach to prevent 
backward and forward linkages, you know, to prevent uh, low and no regret interventions so that we have a sustainable tomorrow. Thank you so much. I believe Dr. Dipankar is getting reconnected. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let me check. Mr. Mustak or someone would like to take any lead on uh, uh, Mr. Dipankar has got disconnected and is connecting back. You connect him back. All right, I think he's uh, frequently getting disconnected. Would anyone else would like to take the lead, the moderator or Mr. Mustak? Uh, I think. Okay, now uh, Dr. Dipankar Shah is not connecting, he's got some problem. So I would like to invite uh, Ms. Silpa Nishal to present her. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much. And I think the last speaker of the last session, I think I I need to be a little quick with what I had to say. Um, I'll try to share my screen if. Uh, is my presentation visible? Yes, ma'am. We can see that. We can make it to full screen. Thank yeah, you. So we can. We can. Yeah, so, um, yeah. So I'll be. I'll be a little fast. Uh, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of aspects, a lot of issues have already been talked about. And uh, from the CI perspective, you know, it's more from the, from the point of view of what the industry is uh, going through. So certainly, like the other stakeholders, industry too is grappling with challenges. The first and the foremost is, you know, how does the industry ensure operational efficiencies? And uh, in the previous uh, sessions, it was talked that how industry is trying to improve the efficiencies within the fence in terms of uh, undertaking uh, water audits, looking at uh, alternates uh, aspects like municipal industry interface, investing in rainwater harvesting. So all these aspects is something that industry is already looking at. Second very important point, which I think uh, today's uh, entire seminar has been really touching upon is, you know, this entire stakeholder connect and this entire concept of social license to operate. So often industry does face a challenge from the stakeholders perspective, and it, it is always seen as being competing with other stakeholders. So, so, the, so it's very important for industry to ensure that how does it maintain this delicate balance with its stakeholders. Third challenge which the industry faces is how does it ensure sustainability? Because what we have been seeing very recently is that while you are doing a lot of good work inside your plant and you are actually against uh, pegged against the benchmark, you're doing very well compared to both national as well as the international standards on specific water consumption. But the you might you still face the risk of closure because the, that risk is an external risk and it comes from the watershed. So at CI Water Institute, what we have been talking about is that, you know, understand the health of your watershed and please work and start looking at aspects which are beyond compliance. And finally, the, the most important challenge which comes is that, you know, you, you need to prioritize the investment because you have only X amount. So how do you prioritize your investments so that you are doing both adhering to the compliance requirements as well as you are doing strategic investment? Uh, so I'll just very quickly go over uh, the the facts. So so for certainly all these things have been talked about. So what is uh, what is important is you know when we are uh, uh, moving uh, in this entire uh, dynamic system, the whole idea is first first comes the descriptive analytics which which most of us are are actually have been doing for a while. So with, which is you know the situation what the question is what happened. Uh, and then from what happened, it's diagnostic. So, you know, why did it happen? 
and then from why you try to understand a more predictive kind of a thing which is you know when will it happen again and the, and finally the analytics of that predictive uh, is that is the prescriptive analytics so that you've diagnosed you've understood that this is the sequence of events and this is this this is the entire story of how the artificial intelligence and all these tools are actually moving forward in terms of trying to mimic certain aspects and trying to put some relationships in place so that more informed decision makings can be can be done in terms of optimizing the system and it is it is here that the industry has to actually graduate and move which which we are seeing signatures so if you look at this curve uh, which has been taken from uh, from an, uh, from the paper that you can see on the screen uh, the whole idea is that the industry is now moving from reactive to a proactive approach so it's not just uh, compliance with the industry is talking about it's actually moving beyond compliance in terms of looking at the life cycle and ass assessments looking at you know several other aspects which can actually become more proactive it becomes a part of the watershed and it, it tends to undertake aspects such that the, it can contribute to both the ecosystem as well as to the, the the watershed to which they belong and this is the philosophy of ci water institute so ci as you may know has several centers of excellence and water institute was developed in in 2013 primarily with the objective of looking at this core Uh, issue and the various linkages with other resources and the, the 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 philosophy is actually transforming conservation and management changing mindsets and behaviors of stakeholders and also trying to make uh, management practices more effective at the grassroots level so um we do a lot of water audits which is you know a kind of an advisory to our to our companies and our own analysis shows that water audits can actually result in savings anywhere between 20 to 40% low hanging fruits with with very low payback and what you see here you know the for a small company to a large company it can vary the monetary savings could be 6 lakhs per year to 6 lakhs a day a new concept which recently the institute has worked on and we have successfully applied this is a concept which is similar to the energy pinch uh, analysis where you're looking at how do you optimize your resources as well as so you have certain sources of wastewater and you have certain other loops where that wastewater can actually be reused so with the help of this optimizing and cycling within the system you are actually able to reduce the 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 total load which is going to the etp and uh, uh, so you're saving on water you're saving on energy and you're also trying to manage the salts which might become a problem so this is another service that the water institute is working closely and trying to a uh, health industry in terms of improving the systems the third important uh, tool that water institute has is a digital tool which is the watt scan tool and the tool actually captures a lot of data from satellite as well as the remotely sensed data everything is built on a gis platform and there are lots of um, uh, it it is basically it 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 has it is an amalgamation of a lot of uh, models which run behind it which helps in understanding siting of structures monitoring risk to operations urban flooding and even evaluating the impacts of climate change the, these are the four important outcomes which the tool can actually predict for a given watershed what you see is uh, is a watershed for a for a district but it does it, the scales can vary from a district to a taluka to a village to a smaller uh, plant watershed where you can actually on a relative scale for that watershed you can understand you know what are the good pockets where water is generated naturally then based on the based on the land use the soils where will the water go and accumulate itself what are the pockets of high evaporation losses because uh, the water is finite so you you need to control evaporation and finally how does the groundwater story uh, talk in that area based on the uh, information which is available from the various wells based on that you can actually uh, pro provide certain strategies which can help improve the scenario so you can actually locate potential pockets where storage should come up where recharge shaft should come up where where a farm pond should make more sense or where you know uh, contour trenches are in so all these kind of strategies can actually be uh, done so a complete decision facilitation can actually take place with the help of this tool this is just to cite an example that you know uh, we have uh, recently done this in uh, in aurangabad district in pathan taluk where we have with the help of watt scan at a village level we have been able to point out certain 
strategies which um, uh, in that village and we have implemented this with the help of the local partners and uh, the, the what we find is that on the uh, the impacts are actually very promising this was done only uh, in uh, the the structures have seen only first monsoon which was quite um, encouraging but to complete the story certainly along with the supply side measures what is important is to also look at the demand side measures where now the team is working in terms of uh, bringing in uh, alternate methods such as you know uh, uh, improving sericulture looking at evaporation control uh, measures like shade nets which are both remunerative as well as they help in controlling the water which is uh, required in that area so finally to sum up uh, from the perspective of an industry healthy businesses can only thrive if you have healthy watersheds and source vulnerability source protection they are key to water security and this is what the industry is now beginning to realize and they are taking this up uh, in a much more uh, streamlined and strategic manner more scientifically and if we look at the industry's perspective both inside and outside optimizing fresh water consumption and utilizing wastewater as a resource is something which is very important and he can help build the sustainable competitive advantage thank you thank you madam uh, uh, nishal i i am sorry that i disconnected for few moments and uh, uh, all the panelists have contributed immensely uh, 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 i uh, missed uh, some interaction after dr marcilla's uh, talk uh, so oh, one thing dr marcilla you are uh mentioning about the community and aquifer connect this is very very important but i should say that there should be uh, some government and aquifer connect also in the state government you know the ground water is getting importance day by day and uh, you see if you see the state government scenario the state ground water departments are dying day by day so uh, uh, serious introspection should be done you know to what extent we should go further with our uh, uh, old format uh, water resource department very big irrigation department rather we should focus on uh, expertise development so expert department the state government uh, and also uh, the ngos and civil societies they have developed immense capacity on ground water i would say a uh, very well understanding of ground water i was going through uh, listening the veena's dr srinivas and veena srinivasan's presentation what wonderful work uh, she is doing and another thing you have mentioned that watershed uh, activity is going ahead ground water recharge is uh, enhancing ground water storage is enhancing and at the same time there is part of ground water well structure i mean if more ground water is available so there will be more number of well and ultimately maybe it leads to more over, over exploitation of uh, ground water i am not sure uh, recently we have published one paper in journal of hydrology Re uh, regional very recently where we have seen that in the kutch area of gujarat the drip because of the drip irrigation invasion of drip irrigation the irrigated area has increased many fold and the ground water recharge is only 10% of the total ground water extraction very dismal situation there uh, anyway you have raised uh, very vital points thank you for that and uh, uh, madam uh, nishal you have uh, pointed out the activities that has been taken up in triveni institute in confederation of indian industries the fiki and the cii these two organizations are uh the are there they are association of industries doing lot of water related work or increasing water use efficiency and advising industries uh and uh, you rightly mentioned that the wastewater is i would say is a is a is becoming an immensely important water resource treated wastewater and uh, uh, thanks to all the panelists we are uh, late but still there are lot of attendees lot of interest with lot of interest they were listening and last word i would say that the water is such a subject previously when we entered into central groundwater board i spent my life in central groundwater board i thought that this is the this is the water you know we are geologists then there are geophysicists then there are 
chemist and say meteorologist and they only work with water and all that then gradually and as the horizons are expanding we find that there are geographers there are sociologists there are doctors there are engineers there are computer engineers there are software engineers uh, there are lawyers you know uh, philip kulet one of the you can say working on ground water uh, uh, regulation uh, he is a is a very good lawyer also there are many lawyers who are working on ground water regulation or water regulation anyway it's a wide subject so solutions cannot be unilateral but above all everybody now agrees that participation of community is essential and all stakeholders should come into uh, if not one flat platform in a commonly formatted a uh, platform to solve the water issues in, in india so with this i think uh, we have done enough for today and thanks to all the panelists and thanks to all the uh, attendees also who spent their entire day with uh, us and uh, obviously enriched us so with this i will take uh, all of your permission to uh, close the uh, day long seminar and hope we'll uh see you all again thank you thank you all thank you thank <clears throat>